I'm talking about the reasons we need to eat food and there's eight main reasons that I've just grouped together and let me just summarize them because I'm about to talk about the final reason the eighth reason first reason is to eat for nutrition people yes sometimes have to eat to get energy and nutrients but it's very not much and the second reason to eat is to eat for fun to relieve boredom for social interaction that's a good reason but it's not really healthy for you it's just fun we do it anyway third reason is to satiate the addictive things in foods things like flavor enhancers things like preservatives flavorings colorings and also the addictive qualities that things like bread and rice and milk have because these things stimulate the opiate receptors in the brain hence a child will always go back to the mother's breast why because it's addicted to it chemically then the fourth reason is to uh, move your bowels to relieve constipation because often for many people unless they eat more food they don't have a bowel movement and if you don't have a bowel movement you get sick very very quickly after a while then the fifth reason is to clear your stomach and intestines of fermented and putrefied matter i'm going to summarize this later for you and uh you know this is after maldigestion why would you maldigest food why do people maldigest food well if you have a very stressful life your digestive system turns off what can make the stress in your life well you can make stress in your life just by turning on the news you can make stress in your life with your job, with your relationships, with your work. You can also make stress in your life with inappropriate exercise. Inappropriate exercise, overstretching, over tensing, over breathing, over thinking can actually turn off your immune system and your digestive system and your reproductive system and you won't be able to absorb nutrients, eliminate waste. And so that means that then when you eat food, which could be just a craving, just got to eat just to occupy myself or craving for whatever other reason I've mentioned, then that food's not going to be eaten by you. It gets eaten by the bacteria inside you and it will ferment and putrefy. And as it ferments and putrefies and rots inside you, your internal body will start saying to your mind, please push more food through to push this stuff through. And you would think that's just hunger. I'm hungry. Not so incredible. Then the next reason, the sixth reason I've given to the reasons why we need to eat food is to alleviate hypoglycemia, to alleviate the effects of excess sugar use, because sugar is a fuel that only lasts for a very short time inside our body. And most of the time you're, you're affecting your sugar levels inside your body by your insulin levels and high levels of insulin will start to cause a problem because they've caused most uptake of sugar. But eventually that high level of insulin becomes insulin resistance and later it becomes diabetes of, you know first level and second level diabetes not a good thing so living off sugar is not a good idea and of course bread and rice and all grains will usually end up as sugar anyway even things like carrots you have to watch for I'll eat raw carrots I'm about to grate some nice organic carrots for my salad in a few minutes but I never eat cooked carrots because cooked carrots have a much higher glycemic index they become very sweet you taste that and so the seventh reason I just mentioned before why, why people uh, tend to choose to eat when often they don't need to is to feed and satiate the parasites inside us. And I was saying how, you know, different types of creatures living inside us from as big as Ascaris worms, 10 centimeters long, to as small as viral particles or even episomes. These things can affect the way we think and what we choose for food. So sometimes we're not eating for our purposes, we're eating for the needs of the creatures living inside us. Then the eighth reason, eighth reason we need to eat is to do with balancing pH. And this is the one that I'm actually most passionate about because the, the, the thing is, the more you eat generally, the more acidic you get for most people. And the more acidic you get, the more you have to breathe. And the more you breathe, the more you will want to eat. It's like a, a cycle. You see, our bodies have to maintain a, a pretty neutral pH. It's, our blood has to remain between 7.35, 7.45 to have adequate gas exchange inside the blood. So what happens is when we eat certain foods, it will affect the pH. pH is the acid alkaline level, acid base level. Certain foods leave a much more acidic residue inside the body. Certain foods leave a much more alkaline residue residue inside the body. The acidic foods include things like meat, fish, eggs, nuts, grains. The alkaline foods include things like fruit, salad, vegetables. Now, many people think we need to be more alkaline. 
No, you don't want to be more alkaline. You want to be neutral. An ideal balance between acid foods and alkaline foods will be a, a plate which has a very, very small amounts of acidic foods because they're, they're usually quite concentrated and a very large amount of fresh fruit, salad, vegetables, maybe steamed vegetables because they're mainly water. So it's not like you want to have you know, just half-half acid and alkaline foods. In terms of volume, you probably need nine-tenths of your plate of what you eat being mainly fruit, salad and vegetables and only one-tenth for a healthy person to be the higher intensity, higher concentration, higher protein food. One-tenth maybe. But most people do the opposite. So most people's net uh, input to their body with food will be acidic food and that acidic food will cause problems inside the body and the body does not like to be acidic so it does a couple of major things three things in fact that I can think of to, to diminish the acidity inside your body that you're that you're intaking through food one is it will try and secrete the acidity through your urine and through sweat and things like this and through your bowels you try and eliminate it the second thing is you try and neutralize the acidity that you eat through your food through high protein food etc and you do that with um, bleaching of the alkaline reserve in your body which is that in the bones and the teeth you see, the bones and the teeth contain lots of calcium and you dissolve calcium in water or blood, you get calcium hydroxide, which is like sodium hydroxide, which is a, a base. So if you eat too much acidic foods, it's going to cause leaching of calcium from the bones. And so it's no surprise, perhaps, that many of the countries which have the highest meat intake, highest dairy intake, also will have the highest levels of osteoporosis. This is a pretty obvious thing. And I, I took years to study it, but you can actually prove it in our book on, on the Applied Anatomy Physiology book that we sell on, on our websites. You can, um, you can read about the research that they've done to show this, that the more you eat acidic foods, which is often things like high protein foods, processed foods, meat, fish, chicken, eggs, nuts, grains, etc., this leads to leaching of calcium from your bones. And when the calcium leaches from your bones and binds with the acid residues of your food, you get these acid-base complexes. So you know at school, when you're at school, you probably, maybe, if you're not old enough, if you're not too old, remember at school, in high school, you did these experiments where you mix, mix acid and base, like hydrogen chloride, HCl, plus sodium hydroxide, bicarbonate of soda, mix them together. The products will be always uh, a salt and water. In the case of HCl plus NaOH, you get NaCl, table salt, and H2O, water. But if you mix, which is very simple, table salt's not harmful really, and that, that you know, compared to most things, many things, and water's obviously not harmful either. But if you mix complex acid residues, which come from food, often toxic food that people eat, and mix that with calcium coming from your bones, you get these very insoluble calcium complexes. And these insoluble calcium complexes are going to lodge inside your blood vessels, they're going to lodge inside your kidneys, your gallbladder, your liver, they're going to lodge uh, in, inside your joints. And you end up having very weak bones and very stiff joints. Does that sound familiar to older people? This is the result of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of eating over acidic foods. So what's the other reason that people actually uh, how, what's the other reason that, make, that makes people balance the acidity of their foods? They do it through breathing. You see, when we breathe, we breathe in a combination of 80%, you know, 79% nitrogen, then about 20% of uh, what we breathe is oxygen, 0.5% of what we breathe is carbon dioxide and about 0.5% other you know, noble gases, etc. But when we breathe out, what we do is we create a lot of carbon dioxide inside our body. And many people think carbon dioxide is a waste, but actually it's the essence of what in the Indian world they call prana. And it's the essence of what in China they call qi. And this carbon dioxide has many fantastic things in it, the things that make it really, really useful. Carbon dioxide inside the body causes an expansion of the blood vessels to your brain. It causes a calming of your nervous system. It causes the, um, the uh, uh, oxygen to travel much more easily from your lungs to your blood. And it allows the access of oxygen from your oxyhemoglobin, the red pigment in your blood cells, 
to allow the oxygen to leave the blood cells and enter your body cells. We need to build up carbon dioxide inside your body. So how do you build up carbon dioxide inside your body? Not by breathing more, by breathing less. The less you breathe, the more you build up carbon dioxide inside your body. The more you breathe, the more you blow off carbon dioxide inside your body. Now carbon dioxide, when it's dissolved in water or blood, becomes carbonic acid. So the more you breathe, the more you get rid of your carbon dioxide, the more you get rid of your carbonic acid, the more you become more alkaline. You see, so one of the mechanisms many people do who eat lots of food and eat lots of high protein, heavy food especially, they will breathe a lot. And you often see people panting after a heavy meal because what this does is it gets rid of some acidity out of your body. But this acidity that you're getting rid of is simply carbonic acid, and that's actually quite healthy acidity. It will give you the ability to function, but in the end, you're still going to leach calcium from your bones. You're still going to end up blocking your arteries, veins, stuffing up your joints, and in the end, you die. So it can work the other way around. If you choose to stop over-breathing and actually start to consciously breathe in the beginning more naturally, and stop thinking things like, I'm exercising, I should breathe more. And actually stop thinking, like many people think, that breathing more is good for you. No, it's not. Fit people don't breathe much and they run fast. Healthy people exercise strongly and they can hardly breath their, they hear their breath at all. Whereas sick people walk slowly and breathe a lot. Some people do exercise and pretend to be sick when they breathe like this. <sighs> Now, some people get upset when I say that. I'm not saying that's wrong to do that. Sometimes I'll do that. I'll breathe hard and fast for five minutes, but then you compensate afterwards by not breathing. If I breathe like that for five minutes, I won't breathe for five or six minutes afterwards. Hold my breath for five or six minutes. But if you just breathe a lot and leave it at that, you will cause over alkalinity in your body that causes problems with your nervous system and it will make you very, very hungry afterwards. The one thing I often say to my students is that if you're not sure about what I'm saying, look at what happens when you do one of the most commonly uh, done forced over-breathing exercises, which is when people do this, they go. <sighs> it's freestyle swimming. This is what they sometimes call the Australian crawl. And what you're doing is you inhale, you do three strokes, exhale, inhale, do three strokes, exhale. And when my children were being taught how to swim, they were taught inhale and then exhale. It was like breathing arm, bubble arm, breathing arm, bubble arm. This just teaches children to hyperventilate. I don't mind my children hyperventilating because it makes them hungry. But as an adult, you don't want to be hungry all the time. Once you're grown up, you're grown up. You don't need to grow up more. You just need a very, very small amount of food to give you that minimal amount of energy. And, you know, some people talk about breatharianism. Is it possible? Well, look, you ask anyone in India, do breatharians exist? They'll straight away say yes. Ask anyone in the West, does breatharianism exist? Most people say no. But I believe it's very possible to live off very, very small amounts of food. I've had, um, there was many, many different fasts in my life. I'll talk about them another time. But one fast I did, which was a six-month juice fast, at the end, my mother, I think she's here watching now. Hi, Ma said, um, darling, you're looking a little bit thin. You should really eat. It's been six months. Please eat some solid food. And I went to the mirror and I thought, oh, I do look a bit thinner. And then I went to weigh myself and it turned out I was two kilos heavier than I was six months earlier. And what had happened was in the six months, I'd lot, lost a lot of excess fat, not that I had too much, but I'd put on muscle in that six months. It's possible to actually gain weight by eating very small amounts of food, but being efficient. So the whole point about this last reason why many people eat food is to balance pH. So the more you breathe, the hungrier you get. The less you breathe, the less hungry you get. I invite you to try the exercise. Do a practice, do a series of exercises, and one day do it, breathe normally. And then afterwards, measure how hungry you are subjectively, obviously. Then the following week or the following day, do the same exercise again. And during the exercise, do deep, full breath in, deep, full breath out, deep, full breath in, 
Deep four breath out, do three seconds, full breath in, three seconds, full breath out. Do that throughout your exercise session. At the end, notice subjectively, are you more hungry? Most people say yes, as well as being more dizzy as well, more nauseous, more toxic as well, or more uncomfortable. Then the next time you exercise, consciously try to breathe as little as possible and see how that affects it. The thing is, it's very difficult to actually consciously breathe less than normal. That's called pranayama in some places. So I can breathe just one breath a minute for an hour. Or I can breathe one breath every two minutes for about 30 minutes. But I've been doing it for like 50 years. I've been practicing breath control. And, you know, if you want to, I can really happily show you some mouth breath, breath control, uh, breath control exercises. But the simplest thing to do if you want to learn how to breathe less is just stop over breathing. Stop thinking it's good to breathe more and start breathing a little bit more naturally in things you do. That's that's all I suggest to most of my students. It's too difficult to tell someone to breathe less. Just breathe naturally. What's natural breathing? Inhale low, exhale passive. Don't think about it too much. Don't make it too much. Breathe through your nose. Easy. Do the same sleep that you, the same breath you do when you're asleep while you're exercising. It'll give you a net acidity in your body rather than a net alkalinity, which will make you crave less acidic foods. And if anything, you either won't be hungry after your practice, or if you want anything, it might be some simple fruit salad or vegetables. So there it is. What I've done is I've given you the reasons why we need food. And there's eight of them I've listed. I'll summarize them quickly, and I'll write it in the post also afterwards in the notes. So one is the need for nutrition. That's a very, very small amount. How much do we eat, need to eat for... Uh, uh, energy or nutrients, hardly at all, especially as adults. Kids are a different story. Second reason we need to eat is eating for fun, social interaction, relieving boredom. Third reason we need to eat is to relieve the addictive effects of many foods, such as flavor enhancers and even bread and rice have addictive qualities. They affect the opiate receptors in the brain. Third reason we need to food, eat food is to, um, uh, that's the third reason. Fourth reason is to help move your bowels to relieve constipation. And if people don't, if people get constipated, they will you basically get very, very sick. Many people eat food just to push the old food through. Then the fourth reason people need to eat is to, the fifth reason rather, is to clear your stomach and your intestines of fermented and putrefied food coming as a result of maldigestion. Why are you maldigesting food? Well, possibly you're stressed in your everyday life and with stress you get a flight or fight response which turns off your digestive system can't digest food. Many people over, uh, mal combine their foods as well. I'll talk about that another time. But once you're mal digesting food, then who's going to eat the food? If you're not digesting it, something else eats it. It's going to be the parasites inside you, the bacteria inside you.